Welcome to Insider Events Financing a Sustainable Future, Accelerate the Net Zero Transition in partnership with Bank of America. Here's our host, Insider Finance Correspondent, Aaron Weinman. Hi, I'm Aaron Weinman, a finance correspondent at Insider. I'm honored to have been welcomed back to host Insider's next event in its Financing a Sustainable Future series. Today, we'll be talking about how the world of corporate finance can accelerate the net zero transition and how the markets are funding the energy transition to net zero. This is the second in Insider's four-part series that we've dubbed Financing a Sustainable Future. These focus on the four pillars of ESG reporting as driven by the World Economic Forum's agenda that is centered around non-financial disclosures addressing people, the planet, prosperity, and principles of governance. In line with the planet pillar, today we are dissecting the E in ESG, specifically companies and banks' efforts to advance not just the discussion on lower carbon emissions and that push to reach net zero, but the capital raising requirements that support these initiatives. We'd love for you, our audience, to join the conversation on social media by using the hashtags Insider Events and Sustainable Future. You can also submit questions for our panelists through the dashboard at the bottom of the screen. And we want your feedback. So in the dashboard, you'll see an icon for our survey. You can take it at any time during or just after the event. Now, I'm delighted to introduce my guests, Karen Fang, Managing Director and the Global Head of Sustainable Finance at Bank of America, Kathleen McLaughlin, Executive Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer at Walmart, and Sophia Mendelssohn, the Chief Sustainability Officer and Global Head of ESG for Cognizant. For those of us watching, can each of our panelists today tell us a bit about your role and how it connects with your company's work in sustainable finance? Um, Karen, perhaps we can start with you. Thank you, Aaron, and great to be here with you, Kathleen and Sophia. Um, I think it's uh, hopefully we're going to have a very interesting discussion around the E-pillar. My job is uh, um, I run the global sustainable finance business at Bank America. That means to work, you know, I work with our C-suite and our board um, and across our A lines of business from consumer small business all the way to global banking and markets to work globally across industry sectors to make sure we mobilize and deploy capital that's in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals with the two focus areas, environmental transition to a net zero future for all of us, but also social equity and social inclusive development. Brilliant, thank you. And Sophia, perhaps you'd like to go next. Thank you, and thank you to the audience for giving us your time today. I'm Sophia Mendelssohn, the Chief Sustainability Officer of Cognizant. Cognizant is a Fortune 200 company with 330,000 employees in over 30 countries. As a technology company, we're often the people behind the curtain, running your credit card systems, healthcare systems, or even pizza delivery systems. Specifically, my job is to think about the macro, environmental, and social trends happening around the world, digest them, predict them, and understand how they're relevant to Cognizant's key stakeholders, including our investors, our clients, and our employees. Ultimately, what we're trying to do with these trends is help proliferate our business and grow revenue. Gotcha. Thanks for that. And finally, Kathleen, tell us about your gig at Walmart. Well, thanks, Aaron. It's great to be here with you today and with Sophia and Karen. So I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Walmart. And in that capacity, I work with colleagues all across Walmart to come up with and execute strategies that really help us create shared value. So that means addressing the needs of our stakeholders in terms of environmental issues, social issues, governance issues in ways that meet stakeholder needs and also uh, help strengthen our business. I also happen to look after the Walmart Foundation and we bring philanthropy together with our business initiatives in an effort to accelerate progress on broader systemic issues like climate change and some of the things we'll be talking about today. Fantastic. Thank you, Kathleen, and thanks everyone for introducing yourselves. So let's unpack a lot of those things. But before we do that, let's start with some of these toolbox items and really like why they matter when it comes to financing sustainable initiatives. So um, what are they? I've got a list here of green bonds, sustainability linked bonds or loans, financings from development banks that service projects or project finance for renewable energy 
I mean, these all cover that E pillar, if you like. And so, Karen, from the financing perspective, how have they evolved? Sure. So let's unpack that indeed a little bit. Um, so everything, you know, whether it's a project, whether it's social equity, whether it's a strong, you know, initiative on the racial front, everything does take capital. So to your point, different forms of financing can be uh, utilized to achieve the goal um, of implementing, executing, tracking a project to success. Um, so you, 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 you just talked about a bunch of financing instruments. Um, I think it's important to think through an asset side of a balance sheet of a company or a liability side. Some of the instruments that you mentioned, whether it's green bonds or social bonds or sustainability bonds, which are really just both green and social use of proceeds, as well as this new class of phenomenon, sustainability linked bonds or sustainability linked loans. These are KPI structures that could be beneficial for issuers um, slash borrowers and investors, right? So these are what company can utilize to borrow money uh, to uh, implement environmental and social projects. On the asset side, clearly there are different ways of companies could use different forms of financing, right, in terms of, hey, how do we actually think about, you know, uh, government funding, grant funding, foundation funding, to Kathleen's point, right, and then different forms of capital from multilateral development banks and development finance institutions when it comes to emerging markets that many of us on this panel operate within. So I, I think it's important to think through, you know, for a CFO and treasurer of a large company, what are they using, whether it's company level borrowing, whether it's project level borrowing, whether it's ESG capital markets instruments or typical bank financing where you know, uh, the loan proceeds could be used for a specific purpose that we're talking about. So the market has definitely grown a lot. Um, you know, we can, hopefully we'll get to some of that, but ESG bond market alone across all of those financings that we talked about has grown to uh, over $1.6 trillion last year, which is an all time high. It's been doubling every year in the last couple of years, but still all of this combined you know, very strong momentum, all of these, these forms of financing because investors are very supportive of the company's initiatives and government's initiatives to advance ESG agenda, to advance, you know, environmental and social sustainability. But all of this momentum still amounts to a huge funding gap. According to the United Nations, it costs anywhere between three to five trillion dollars a year to, to accomplish the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. According to a recent McKinsey study, the total number um, of dollars needed between now and 2050 is a whopping $275 trillion, which is over $9 trillion a year. So depending on who you ask, pretty much everyone is going to tell you we still don't have enough money, uh, even if investors are very focused on it. So with that in mind, I mean, I, I want to bring in Kathleen really quickly because you are the perfect example of a borrower and how are borrowers being held accountable? Well, so uh, of the different instruments you mentioned, we issued our inaugural green bond last September. It was a $2 billion issuance that was part of a $7 billion issuance in tranches of, um, you know, 5, 7, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, and we were excited about it. It was the first time that we've done something in this direction. And we did it to align our financing more closely with our corporate strategy. And sustainability is a big part of that. And so um, it allows essentially investors to participate in initiatives that are going to help us meet our goals to get to zero emissions in our operations by 2040. We have uh, related goals around restoring and conserving and more sustainably managing 50 million acres of land and a million square miles of ocean through our sourcing and philanthropy and other, other mechanisms. So um, we were excited to do this and it really underscores our commitment to sustainability. We've been making investments in these areas for a number of years now, but this was a chance for us to align our financing with our initiatives. Gotcha, so what happens if, if um, you don't meet said initiatives? I mean, how does it work from a capital raising perspective? And again, to my earlier point about accountability, I mean, talk me through that. Well, so we issued uh, this bond under the green financing framework. And of course, a big part of that is to declare the different eligible uh, investment categories and then to report on an annual basis how we're doing against that. So, um, you know, we'll be doing that. And the categories that we've declared would involve things like renewable energy 
energy efficiency, high performance buildings in general that would also go to HVAC equipment, refrigeration, that sort of thing. Sustainable transportation, our efforts to electrify our fleet. Um, it will likely involve hydrogen investments as well. Our investments around getting to zero waste in our operations and also transitioning our packaging to become 100% reusable, recyclable, compostable, really part of trying to create more of a, a circular economy. Uh, I mentioned nature. So investments that we have underway around habitat restoration and conservation, water, water quality, water conservation, water efficiency, um, that's a big part of it uh, as well. And so um, under the green financing framework and the, and the green bond principles, by declaring those categories, that's what will put the $2 billion um, you know, equivalent to those proceeds to work to, to, um, you know, in terms of investments. So we'll be reporting uh, on that at least annually, and that will include the allocation of those proceeds to those different eligible green investments. And then also on a best efforts basis, um, if we can describe the impact so, for example, in terms of impact on our lowering emissions to get to zero emissions um, from the different uh, categories of spend. So I think that's really the main accountability mechanism. We, we intend to deliver against uh, those commitments. And, you know, if we have a hope of doing future such financings, you know, it's on us to actually deliver against what we've set out here. The way these instruments are sort of structured and, and the, the sort of strict rules that you have to follow, I want to know if we, if if I could be a bit forward looking, what can we kind of do to make these instruments better, for lack of a better word? Well, we're new to this. You know, this is the first uh, such issuance that we've made. So we're we're going to learn as we go here. Um, our hope is that you know, if I just even look at our operating plans this year and next year, we already have in mind areas where we plan to allocate these proceeds. We'll report on it. We'll get feedback from the lenders, we'll get feedback from other uh, stakeholders, we'll learn and see what else needs to be done. Um, we're not new to reporting on progress on sustainability. We've been issuing sustainability reports that include metrics um, that we have set out against goals to hold ourselves accountable since, gosh, about 2007, I believe. So we've been at it a while. Um, and, and to me, this is just a next stage evolution in that. And we look forward to you know, getting feedback on how it goes and making it stronger from there. What, and why did the company go down this route? I mean, what's the, what's the genesis of this here? Well, we, as I said, we've been working on sustainability uh, for quite some time now. It's been about 15 years since we set out some pretty ambitious goals around energy and waste and product sustainability and so on. Um, and we have many initiatives that we've had underway across those arenas. We've made some decent progress. We have very ambitious goals that are based, uh, for example, science-based targets for emissions reduction. Um, we partner with other experts around our waste goals, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and so on. So we're not new, in a sense, to sustainability and reporting on it. Yet, we're a shared value company. You know, We want everything that we're doing in terms of our strategies, our operations, and our financing to be aligned with those aspirations. So it was a chance for us to bring in uh, a part of our business, which is just where does our financing come from and make it more explicitly aligned with the strategies that we've been undertaking for some time. And we also heard from investors on the debt side saying, gosh, you know, we'd like a way to participate in this. You know, we've got our own goals and you guys are working on stuff. Why don't we marry these things together? Give us a chance to participate. Give us a chance to get in on it. So, um, you know, from that perspective, it just gets the words and music lined up on the financing side. Gotcha. No, that's really helpful. And you, you, that dovetails quite nicely with the next thing I wanted to ask you um, before I, you know, Sophia, I, I do want to bring you into the, the conversation from investors perspective. Um, but just before we move to that, talk me through, talk us through your discussions with lenders and investors and how the, you know, how has the product evolved? I'm guessing, you know, the conversations you have with your relationship banks are very different from what they were when green bonds were in their infancy, for example. Talk me through that discussion and how it's evolved, really, for a company like Walmart. Well, we started talking about the possibility of issuing a green bond back in 2019. Uh, and we looked at different options. You, you threw out a different um, set of ways to go. We also considered other arenas. Sustainability is one of our ESG priorities. We also have 
significant ambitions and initiatives related to economic opportunity, to gender and racial equity, to strengthening resilience of communities, uh, and so on. Um, so we did discuss what would the scope of our first ESG bond you know, look like, and we decided to start with sustainability because in part of what you were just saying, Aaron, you know, we, we said across our whole portfolio, where do we have initiatives underway that um, really have operational KPIs? We can link them to the spend in a clearer way. Um, we can see how we would report in, a, you know, in the near term over the next year on the allocation of the proceeds. And they were arenas that are really, really urgent in terms of action um, you know, related to what we've just been talking about. So getting to zero emissions in our own operations. So our electricity purchases, our transportation, our refrigeration, our on-site fuels, our waste and circularity and so on. So we just had such a rich portfolio that um, you know, we could set out and make part of this bond. We decided to start there. So we'll learn. You know, and as we go, uh, I'd say watch this space. It's quite possible that we will uh, bring on other offerings over time. But as I said, we're new to it. We want to learn, um, learn what we don't know, and then go from there. Absolutely. And you bring up a good point about learning. It, it, this really has been a, a, you know, a steep learning curve for everyone involved in the space. But one of the biggest parts of the, the green bond or ESG financing uh, ecosystem are the investors. So, Sophia, what are they asking for? Because if what's happening in Congress right now at the SEC and all of that jazz, a lot is, a lot is being asked. So tell us about that and the current landscape. Sure. I'm forever going to think about it as jazz from here on in. But um, as, as Karen and Kathleen laid out, ESG has become a critical part of a company's financial structure, strategy, infrastructure investments. So it's therefore no surprise that it's now at the level of attention of large investors and therefore the SEC. I mean, fundamentally, what investors want to know from this information is, is your company a good investment that fits their investment strategy if they're a long-term investor? that's going to be allowed around for the long run, that's going to be able to weather the storm, no pun intended, of the changes climate is going to bring. And to be able to do that, they need to be able to look at folks like Kathleen's ESG report and compare it to her competitors, same for Cognizant as an issuer. They need to be able to derive alpha from it that they can put into in their investment decision, which means consistent disclosures. And that's really where the SEC steps in and is coming in. Basically, it's the market saying this non-financial data is now highly relevant to our financial decisions. So transparency is a big part of this, but there's also the metrics that are attached to the financings, right? And you bring up the fact that alpha is something that's generated here. These are, these are not just instruments that make you feel warm and fuzzy anymore. These are, these are genuine money-making instruments, right? Whether it's a green bond, whether it is becoming a B Corp and doing an IPO that's attached to that. Talk to us about the metrics attached to sustainability-linked transactions and what do you want to see to make them better or to make, you know, to make more people, more companies issuing these sorts of transactions? Yeah. Oh, and I would start by arguing, I don't really think this was ever about feeling warm and fuzzy. I think this was about establishing a company's purpose so that the board know has how to oversee the CEO, the CEO and the CFO's office can steer the company through their strategy to a true place of market differentiation. And now addressing environmental and social issues, finding positive revenue drivers or brand benefits, adherence and alliances with your stakeholders is part of all that. And of course, those are very big concept and very big words. So all of our stakeholders, investors, associates, communities, want to know how that's going to happen and along what time frame. And that's where you really get the concept of interim targets. So companies like Cognizant have a net zero goal. Kathleen outlined many of Walmart's long-term goals. The question is, how should an investor or even an employee judge and see progress year on year? And that's specifically where you see targets around renewable energy, 
around water use and around diversity and inclusion. And I think for the audience, they can really look for and focus on metrics that show a company is achieving progress along its net zero journey and achieving progress along its social commitments, be those skilling of a talent pipeline or workforce or particular uh, metrics of diversity and inclusion in management. So Karen, um, how can banks and you know, their issuing clients sort of beholden themselves to higher benchmarks um, as, as it pertains to these financing instruments? Sure, I, I actually um, um, can talk both from an underwriter distributor standpoint because we are a top underwriter of ESG bonds uh, in capital markets, but also as a one of the largest issuers of ESG bonds ourselves. Um, you know, we've done nine different offerings, uh, close to about twelve billion dollar proceeds to date. Uh, so very much echo Kathleen's sentiment that the you know at least annual reporting, right? So the frequency has to be at least annually and has to be very transparent across the use of proceeds is a very good way for investors and, and issuers to be connected on a regular basis to measure progress and impact. Um, I like that you know, um, expression to marry the music with the, uh, with the words, and that's exactly what um, I think issuers could be doing more in terms of having even more transparency to show progress on how they are reducing emissions and how they are helping improve circular economy, another very important topic, uh, how they are improving both climate uh, transition but also not losing uh, the focus on nature and biodiversity. So I think from a metric standpoint, just to kind of now speak from an underwriter dis distributor standpoint, you know, we sit on the executive committee of the ICMA, which is International Capital Markets Association, that co helps come up with the green bond principles and social bond principles and other ESG in instruments in terms of the framework of how issuers should be thinking about it. I think we don't know what we don't know yet. As the world evolves, you know, to more sophisticated and frankly more impactful uh, environmental sustainability and social sustainability financings. I hope the framework and the KPIs and the stringent nature of those KPIs and how we should measure and report on those KPIs become more evolved as well. So that is definitely something we as sort of a capital markets underwriter, issuer and, and participant, we want to help promote a better principle and better framework Right, and when you think about the warm and fuzzy, that Sophia says it should never be about warm and fuzzy. Cannot agree more. It should always be about measurable impact. So we need to make sure the penalty or the reward of achieving a KPI or not achieving a KPI, you know, is not symbolic. We have to make sure the KPI is very measurable and evolving with science-based targets. Because not, you know, take one example. Not all renewable energy projects are good. There are different categories, there are different impact on nature, a different impact on people, there are different types of you know, emissions intensity, there's different types of capacity factor. We have to make sure we evolve those standards and disclosure as well, so we know not everything is made equal. Um, we have to obviously also disclose social impact alongside environmental impact as well. So I think those things will have to evolve over time and especially the sustainability linked bonds and market and loans market has a lot of growing up to do. So let's get under the hood of some of these financing instruments. And I also want to talk a bit about what's being done at a higher level. So Sophia, I want to pivot back to you. Um, talk us through this latest SEC proposal and what it wants to see. Yeah, I mean, what, what Karen mentioned is what lays the groundwork for the SEC's proposed rules on climate disclosure. This is about annual reporting that gives the market concrete, comparable information on how a company is digesting their climate risk or their climate opportunity. And what the SEC is proposing is that an issuer talks about first governance. Who's in charge of this? How are you looking after it? Second, strategy. How are you deciding what your climate risk is? What kind of scenarios are you going through to make sure you're still going to be able to get from point A to point, a to point B, even in the face of climate change? And then C, risk management. Climate change is here. The impacts are being felt today, both by the issuers and the investors. 
So how are you going to mitigate that both in an acute emergency like a hurricane as well as over a more long-term period with something chronic like a drought? And then finally, the all-important metrics. What are your goals? When are you going to achieve them? How do you know you're making progress along the way, especially when it comes to the now all-important topic of greenhouse gas emissions? Okay, so transparency is a big part of this proposal is, is, is what I'm getting here and investors want more of it. Um, really simply put, why? Like, How does this help them? They think there's either revenue at risk through stranded assets, assets or profitability to be gained. They want this information for the same reason they want annual financial reporting. How is your company faring? How are you doing it? How are you planning for the future? Give me that information in regular time frames, comparable to your competitors so that I can put it into my investment thesis. What's different here is that we're so used to associating environmental and social topics with the nice to haves, with the fuzzies, if you're lucky, with the purpose. And this is kind of the investors turning on it, it on its head and saying, no, we're welcoming this into the traditional investment thesis and research. So why should companies care to do more about this? And I ask that because this is a costly arguably cumbersome process, right, that requires third party opinions, environmental assessments, more reporting. Is it a tough sell sometimes, just given the costs and extra work involved? Well, I think all the old hats on this panel can talk about the tough sell that we've achieved over the years. And the way we've achieved this sell is, at least for me personally, not by framing it as caring. Caring and my morals is something I do on my personal time. Thinking about this topic as how it aids my CEO's strategy. My company's purpose is how we've moved the needle on reducing risk of stranded assets and opening up free market solutions. So I would encourage the audience to kind of put the caring aside and think about this in your traditional strategic framework. And as for cost, I would also challenge the audience not to assume that anything that has a social or environmental benefit is immediately a cost increase. The case studies now are numerous, well proven that there are financial savings in addressing climate, in reducing environmental impact. Finally, to the cost of transparency and reporting. Yes, naturally being transparent, using a controls environment to reliably disclose that information accurately has an associated cost with it. And no issuer would deny that. But it's a cost that public companies have decided is worth it, that we want to leverage the capital of the public markets. And in return, we're willing to tell you this information in this way. And that's where you really see the coming together of climate disclosure and traditional financial disclosure. Mm -hmm. no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Kathleen, I do want to bring you in here because you are at the vanguard of, of said costs, if you like. But before I do that, one of the early things I found was Whenever I would talk to um, bankers in particular about a green bond, for example, one of the biggest talking points in the early days was diversifying your investor base. Is that still valuable or have so many investors now jumped on the sustainability wagon, if you like, that there's so many to choose from and that the diversity angle is not really there anymore? Kathleen, tell us about that. I think there was a time, to Sophia's point, when you might say, well, there's a socially responsible investor, you know, and then, oh, there's an ESG investor. Um, these days, people just recognize environmental, social governance matters relate to the long-term prospects of any company. So it's what we call shared value at Walmart, but it is this recognition that it's a false trade-off to say I can worry about my financials or I could worry about my ESG. They go hand in hand. I think the same thing is happening in the investors world, uh, investor world, this convergence. So when I spend time with investors in Walmart, whether it's on the equity side or the debt side, 
it's the same group of people coming to talk about everything from, you know, what's our plan to expand online grocery pickup to how are we going on our renewable energy transition to what's going on with the diversity of our officer ranks. These are all in the same conversation because the answers to those questions pertain, as Sophia said, to future growth prospects, future cost structure, resilience, future risks. You know, these, these things are truly integrated. Um, and in the same way, you know, people have talked about, oh, is there a trade-off between serving the shareholder and serving all these other stakeholders? You know, what some people will call stakeholder capitalism. And again, you won't be able to deliver value to the shareholder if you haven't satisfied the customer, engaged and delighted your associates and developed them to, you know, do the things we need to do to run our business, um, retain suppliers and have great relationships with them and, and on and on and on. And even the planet, we consider the planet one of our stakeholders at Walmart because it's actually important for us. Many of the products that we sell come from nature. Our communities all coexist with nature. I mean, there, we could spend a whole hour just talking about that. And that's one of the reasons we've integrated uh, nature into our, into our green bond um, eligible categories. So these things converge. And, and I think that's really what's changed in the last five years is the recognition of how interdependent all of these factors are. Thanks again, Kathleen, for that explanation. I, I just want to go back to Sophia very quickly. Um, is, this is sort of a more of an overarching question, but when we talk about the SEC proposal and dovetailing with Kathleen's earlier comments regarding the process involved in, in preparing for an ESG strategy or financings, the topic of net zero or whatever it might be has become politicized. So why is that? Help me unpack it, help the audience unpack it about why it's become a politicized topic and how, really. Yeah. Well, I think net zero is associated with change and change can be challenging for society and there are always going to be different stakeholders, particularly in government, who have different policy or regulatory solutions for change. What a company can do to navigate that is start with their purpose, their strategy, the core of where their revenue is derived from with their client base or their customers, and apply climate within that lens. And if you read some of the best-in-class ESG reports, you'll see that that's the angle they take it from. So that the company or the issuer is very much coming forward and saying, this is my company's solution to helping other people, be it B2C customers or B2B clients, navigate their own net zero transition. And the more um, stringently, you could almost say, we stick to our business strategy and the possible upside of providing solutions for a net zero journey, I think the more we can stay clear of some of the noise and let that work itself out while a company focuses on its purpose. What is the noise though? Well, I think the noise is a societal level conversation about how we're going to make this transition at what speed, with what tools and solutions first, right? And each continent, each country, each nation state, maybe each county will do that differently. In the US, we largely have shareholder primacy. And that's what you see uh, both funders and issuers responding to, looking at a physical problem in front of them, a physical problem for their supply chain, a physical problem for their real estate portfolio, and saying, how am I going to protect these investments and prepare them for whatever changes climate might bring? Gotcha. On the subject of the changes that climate might bring, you know, the, the instruments that we've alluded to today, be it green bonds or sustainability-linked financings, again, back to you, Kathleen, I mean, what's involved to get to get a company like Walmart ready to go to someone like Karen and say, hey, it's time to issue. I need I need that money. Talk us through that process, because as we've alluded to earlier, there's a lot of work to get to that point. Right. To get to issuance day. So for us, it was a few things. First of all, we had to consider under the green bond principles 
what are categories that companies typically pursue and that investors are typically interested in and do they connect to the um, initiatives that we prioritized at Walmart? And we found lots of great overlap. I've already talked about some of those areas. The second thing then was for us to take a look at our portfolio of initiatives and be confident that we have concrete initiatives that require CapEx, OpEx, and so on, um, where the proceeds of a bond could be allocated and put to good work. And then third, we had to have confidence that we can report on that to your earlier question. So um, those were the discussions that we had within Walmart. And it, you know, it was great to have advisors as well um, um, in the lending community to help us think through this. This was our first bond, uh, as I said, in this way. So that's what we talked about and got comfortable with that. And, you know, we look forward actually to our first report um, of how we've allocated this, uh, this first wave of the proceeds. And is there a cost benefit uh, when you do a deal like this, when you decide to price a bond or a loan um, with green, if you like, metrics? Is there a cost benefit on issuance day that you can speak to? We weren't sure what we'd find because, as I was saying, there has been such a convergence that we've seen certainly on the equity side, and we wondered about the debt side. Um, as it happens, when we came out with the issuance, the $2 billion green bond was part of a broader um, portfolio of $7 billion worth of issuance. And actually, that $2 billion tranche had the highest demand. Now, we don't know if that's because of the green bond aspects or if it was because that was the 10-year tranche and people liked that time frame better than the others. It's hard to say. Um, but anecdotally, we had a lot of interest in it. Uh, and I think for all the reasons that we've been talking about now, which is these challenges we face, you know, the climate uh, crisis, waste, nature, other things that we're working on, uh, many people are interested in those. So if there's an opportunity for investors to align their capital to action that is in those arenas and can be producing results that's attractive uh, to people. Gotcha, no, that's great. And it sounds like this is something that you wanna keep pursuing um, from a capital raising perspective. Is that fair to say? I'd say so. Um, you know, certainly it aligns with our strategy. We have very ambitious goals uh, at Walmart. We, we even describe it now as wanting to become a regenerative company, which is a word we don't use lightly and we don't have any illusions that we're there yet. It's a long-term ambition. But you know, what we're trying to do to get to zero emissions without offsets by 2040 in our operations, what we're trying to do in our supply chain to elevate people and restore and better manage nature, you know, what we're trying to do in terms of our racial and gender equity goals and so on, they're, they're quite ambitious. And you know, like any company um, that has a lot of strategies, uh, the financing's important on the debt side and the equity side, and we'd like it to line up with our core strategies. So I'd say, you know, watch this space. We'll see how it goes with this. We'll learn. We'll go from there. Absolutely. No, that's great. I mean, it's, it's the best way to go about it, I think. And speaking of learning, I mean, Karen, you're educating your clients on the benefits of these, of these initiatives, of these capital raising instruments. Tell us, what are your borrowers or what are your clients asking of, of banks like Bank of America when it comes to capital raising for like ESG-related uh, initiatives? I think a lot of that has been covered by Kathleen and uh, Sophia, and I want to commend them for all the great effort and, and progress to date. And we are collectively learning and evolving, as we say. I think the principles will have to evolve with the market needs and the capital needs. The, the number one question that the issuer, potential issuers are asking um, really is, does this really make a difference to my investors and to my stakeholders? Right, so obviously the, the measurable impact is very important. You know, as Kathleen said, you have to make sure you have enough, you know, proceeds um, needs, right, for you know a, a, a benchmark size corporate bond issuance, and you have to track it on a regular basis and report that to all stakeholders to see. So you can't be making that up. You have to obviously, you know, you know, uphold a pretty stringent set of standards, corporate reporting standards. I mean, I would. I will go off on a tangent by saying I don't think a lot of these ESG disclosure items are non-financial disclosure items in the future. I think as Sophia alluded to that, I think at some point the impact on companies' bottom line becomes quite apparent. When you think about whether it's our research at B of A just on you know, how a better ESG performance companies do have you know, reduced EPS or earnings 
uh, volatility, right? So it has reduced earnings volatility and has better risk adjusted performance um, overall, both for debt and for equity of a company. These things will matter. And how you think about environmental and social sustainability, how, where you invest for the future. I love that word regenerative. I mean, that is the ambition of corporate America. We have to think through, you know, all the impact that we and the footprints we leave on, on planet Earth as well as for our communities. So the issuers really want to understand how are investors going to respond to the use of proceeds? How are they going to re respond to my reporting? You know, what level of stringent disclosure do I need to have on an ongoing basis so people are not, you know, going to think that I were just greenwashing. So a lot of that is really related to reporting and metrics. I think it's easy to issue one. It's hard to track and report on one. So that's why I think these thoughtful preparations that Kathleen talked about and Sophia talked about really is, you know, gold standard in terms of what a corporate should be thinking about and the investor, you know, responds to such issuance. So in terms of what the issuer and the investors think about, what are the banks thinking about? And what I mean by that is, how does a bank like Bank of America structure its sustainable finance offering? Uh, talk us a bit about what Bank of America brings to the table to get a company ready to answer these questions from investors. What's it, what's it offer here, if you like? We, we truly believe in lead by example. So, you know, we are one of the largest issuers in the U.S. corporate space. We have done nine offerings. And through each offering, we learn and we adjust our course and try to do better the next time. I would say we're very proud of all of our green bond offerings, which we've been doing for many years. Um, but we're very proud of the three offerings that we've done since the pandemic started. You know, in May of 2020, we did our COVID social bond, a uh, billion dollar proceeds, really helping the PPE manufacturers, assisted living facilities, uh, not-for-profit hospitals at the time to respond to the pandemic. And that proceeds have been fully deployed, obviously. We issued our impact report on that just to see some of the doctors that were able to get the funding or the PPE manufacturers that were able to get the funding to deliver masks and PPE um, supplies. You know, those things are very heartwarming stories for us, not just for our investors, but frankly for employees at Bank America and for in retention and for recruiting as well. It really is a morale booster. And, and then we issued two different bonds, which we're very proud of. Um, it's really kind of helping racial and, and gender equality. So that's called you know, our equality progress sustainability bond. We do have green proceeds uh, from the bond, but the social pr proceeds were dedicated to the economic opportunity and advancement of the black, Hispanic, and Asian, and Native American communities. Those proceeds you know, are reported again on an annual basis. Um, and we talk about how we make a difference in home mortgage to those communities, in small business lending to the business owners from those communities, in supply chain financing, which with large companies that, that are represented here, collectively we have that responsibility to promote you know, supplier diversity, but also low carbon product suppliers. So those are the examples of those proceeds. So for sure, they're not business as usual. And I think ESG instruments that can be highlighted can actually play a leading role in promoting you know, social and environmental financing in a more evolved fashion. And what about internally? How does Bank of America structure its sustainable finance outfit, if you like? Is it advisory teams? Or do you have, like, say, a ESG champion within every different product of the investment bank? How does it work from a, from a sell side perspective, really? Sure. So I've been with the bank for 12 years, but I got the you know, road to run sustainable finance for the entire bank two years ago. So our team essentially is the quarterback, if you will. We work across our A lines of business. We get, you know, we set the strategy with our C-suite and our board. So we are the, the team that really drives implementation, not just strategy formulation, but also in, you know, strategy implementation across A lines of business. And you're right, we definitely have captains within each of the A lines of business and to make sure the message penetrates the right way throughout the entire organization. We also have you know, 190 plus local markets in the United States, for example. The local markets presidents and that organization is super helpful as well to make sure the message is uh, going through the entire nation on a pretty evenly basis. Oh, that's really helpful. Thanks, Karen. I know it's, it's, very, it's very different at every bank and how they attack ESG, so it's good to know the, the inner workings at B of A. Um, I know we're pretty pressed for time, um, so I wanted to finish with you, Sophia, and just one last question. 
a lot of what we've talked about today, as all of the panelists have, have mentioned, takes a lot of time to get to this specific point. Um, but what are the next steps and what would you say, if there are any at all, are the headwinds that are slowing down this transition? Yeah, I think the key trend for the audience to keep an eye on happening really in 2022 is that we're exiting the age of press releases and long-term goals and announcements, and we're really entering the age of financing for execution, and that there'll be a lot of opportunities, conversation, and money flowing towards the tools, the infrastructure, the charging, the technology that's going to make that execution possible, traceable, and reportable. It really goes to one of Cognizant's central thesis on the topic, which is that a modern business is a sustainable business. And to be a sustainable business, you have to marry your investments in ESG with your existing investments in all manner of other areas, including things like your digital transformation. So for the executive watching this, I would look at the next one to five years as almost a tactical period that's about aligning commitment with execution. Okay, no, that's really helpful. And um, really quickly, Kathleen, same question to you. What's holding a company like Walmart back from doing more or what more can be done in your view? I think the challenge facing all of us was mentioned earlier, which is there is worldwide a significant gap at the moment between the capital um, and technology required to meet the goals that we all need to meet as a society and what we've got in front of us in, in plans if we add it all up around the world. So we've got a long way to go. And we've got many, many um, challenges externally, whether it's still the ongoing effects and continuation of COVID, wars, um, inflation, et cetera. Um, not to mention then we're starting to see the climate effects and other things too. So um, lots of challenge. I remain, despite all of that, an optimist. Uh, I believe in human ingenuity. I think to your point, Sophia, the age of goal setting and trying to figure out what we need to do is done. And now we, we know, so now it's doing. And um, my hope is in the ingenuity of people and, uh, and also innovation to help us unlock what we need to do to execute at pace against these really important goals. Thank you, Kathleen. That's a great response. And look, there's so many more questions I could ask, but I do have to cut it off there. So thank you so much again to our panelists, Karen, Sophia and Kathleen for a lively, informative discussion. Thanks also to our presenting partner, Bank of America. There's evidently still plenty to be gained from investing in sustainable finance, whether it's through the halls of Congress or throughout corporate America. And today we learned a little bit more about how Wall Street and big business are moving the needle on sustainability. These are topics we continue to cover closely at Insider, so be sure to follow us. And remember to share your thoughts using the hashtags InsiderEvents and SustainableFuture. In a few moments, our survey will pop up on your screen. We'd love to get your feedback. Thanks again to all of you for joining us and have a wonderful day.